Hello everybody, just a quick disclaimer. The stories today contain a lot of violence and sexual abuse is mentioned often. If you are not comfortable or too scared, please don't watch anymore. If you continue, don't forget to subscribe. Born Eliza Margaret McNally, around 1859 in County Antrim, Ireland. Her family moved to the US when she was young. In 1879, Halliday married a Greenwich, New York, owned by the alias Charles Hopkins. His real name was Ketspool Brown. They are said to have had one son who ended up institutionalized. In 1881, after Hopkins' death, she married another man, pensioner Artemis Brewer, but he also died less than a year later. Her third husband, Hiram Parkinson, left her within their first year of marriage. Halliday went on to marry George Smith, a war veteran who had served with Brewer, her second husband. After a reported failed attempt to kill Smith by putting arsenic in his tea, Lizzie fled to Bellows Falls, Vermont. She married Vermont resident Charles Plaistel, but she vanished two weeks later. In the winter of 1888, Halliday resurfaced in Philadelphia at a saloon on 1218 North Front Street that was run by the McQuillans, friends she knew from Ireland. Going by the name Maggie Hopkins, Halliday set up a shop, but was later convicted of burning it down for the insurance money. She was sentenced to two years at Philadelphia's Eastern State Penitentiary. In 1889, now going by the name Lizzie Brown, she became the housekeeper for Paul Halliday, a twice-widowed 70-year-old farmer living in Burlingham, New York, with his sons. Their marriage was marred by what Halliday described as Lizzie's sporadic spells of insanity. Within two years, the Halliday family's house and barn burned to the ground, and she was suspected of setting the fires. At some point, she stole a team of horses and had a neighbor help her drive them to Newburgh, New York, where she sold them. She was acquitted of the crime on the grounds of insanity. Nobody knows exactly. In May 1891, the Halliday house was burned to the ground, killing Halliday's mentally handicapped son, John. She was again suspected of setting the fire since she was known to have disliked John. She claimed that he died trying to save her from the flames, but his locked bedroom door was discovered in the rubble and Halliday was in possession of the key. Soon after, she burned down the Halliday barn and mill as well. She attempted to run off with another man but was arrested and sent to an asylum. She was transferred to another asylum, but was then declared cured and released, returning home to Halliday. Paul Halliday disappeared that August. She claimed he had gone to a nearby town to do masonry work. Following the neighbor's suspicions that something was not right about her story, a search warrant was obtained. And on September 4th, the bodies of two women were found buried in hay in a barn. Both had been shot. The women were later identified as Margaret and Sarah McQuillan, New York residents who were part of the family Lizzie had stayed with in Philadelphia. Little could be ascertained from Halliday as, when questioned, she behaved in an erratic manner, tearing at her clothes and talking incoherently. She was kept in custody, and some thought she was merely faking insanity. A few days after the McQuillans were found, Paul Halliday's mutilated body was discovered under the floorboards of his house. He had also been shot. Lizzie was charged with the murders and held for trial at the Sullivan County Jail in Monticello, New York. During her first few months there, she refused to eat, attacked the sheriff's wife, set fire to her own bed, tried to hang herself, and cut her own throat with broken glass, about which she said, I thought I would cut myself to see if I would bleed. Her jailers were forced to chain her to the floor during her remaining months there. On June 21, 1894, Halliday was convicted at the Sullivan County Oyer and Terminer Court for the murder of Margaret McQuillan and Sarah Jane McQuillan. She became the first woman ever to be sentenced to death by electrocution via New York State's new electric chair. Governor Roswell P. Flower commuted her sentence to life in a mental institution after a medical commission declared her insane. Lizzie was sent to the Mattawan State Hospital for the criminally insane, where she spent the remainder of her life. She became a model patient and was trusted with sewing privileges, giving her access to tools, including scissors. She grew close to Nellie Wicks, one of the attendants at Mattawan, but she was deeply upset by Wicks's plans to leave the institution. In 1906, she killed Wicks by stabbing her 200 times with a pair of scissors. Halliday died of Bright's disease on June 28, 1918, after spending nearly half her life in the asylum.
Jane Toppin was born Honora Kelly on March 31, 1854, in Boston, Massachusetts, the daughter of Irish immigrants. Her mother, Bridget Kelly, died of tuberculosis when she was very young. Her father, Peter Kelly, was well known as an eccentric and abusive alcoholic, nicknamed by those who knew him Kelly the Crack, as in crackpot. In later years, Kelly was said to have sewn his own eyelids closed while working as a tailor. In 1860, only a few years after his wife's death, Kelly surrendered his two youngest children, eight-year-old Delia Josephine and six-year-old Honora, to the Boston Female Asylum, an orphanage for indigent female children. He never saw them again. Documents from the asylum note that Delia and Honora were rescued from a very miserable home. No records exist of their experiences during their time in the asylum, but reportedly, Delia became a prostitute while their older sister Nellie, who was not committed to the orphanage, was committed to an insane asylum. In November 1862, less than two years after being abandoned by her father, Honora was placed as an indentured servant in the home of Mrs. Anne C. Toppin of Lowell, Massachusetts. Though never formally adopted by the Toppins, Honora took on the surname of her benefactors to distance herself from her former family and eventually became known as Jane Toppin. The original Toppin family already had a daughter, Elizabeth, with whom Honora was on good terms. In 1885, Toppin began training to be a nurse at Cambridge Hospital. Unlike her early years, where she was described as brilliant and terrible, at the hospital, she was well-liked, bright, and friendly, evoking the nickname Jolly Jane. Once she became close with the patients, she picked her favorite ones, who were normally elderly and very sick. During her residency, Toppin used her patients as guinea pigs in experiments with morphine and atropine. She altered their prescribed dosages to see what it did to their nervous systems. However, she spent considerable time alone with patients, making up fake charts, medicating them to drift in and out of consciousness, and even getting into bed with them. Toppin was recommended for the prestigious Massachusetts General Hospital in 1889. There, she claimed several more victims before being fired the following year. She briefly returned to Cambridge but was soon dismissed for administering opiates recklessly. Toppin then began a career as a private nurse and flourished despite complaints of petty theft. Toppin began her poisoning spree in earnest in 1895 by killing her landlord, Israel Dunham, and his wife. In 1899, she killed her foster sister, Elizabeth, with a dose of strychnine. In 1901, Toppin moved in with the elderly Alden Davis and his family in Katalmet to take care of him after the death of his wife, Maddie, whom Toppin had murdered. Within weeks, she killed Davis, his sister Edna, and two of his daughters, Minnie and Genevieve. The surviving members of the Davis family ordered a toxicology exam on Minnie, which determined that she had been poisoned. Local authorities assigned a police detail on Toppin to watch her. On October 29, 1901, she was arrested for murder. By 1902, she had confessed to 31 murders. Soon after the trial, one of William Randolph Hearst's newspapers, the New York Journal, printed what was purported to be Toppin's confession to her lawyer, she confessed to a total of 31 murders. The killings were carried out in Toppin's capacity as a nurse, targeting patients and their family members. Toppin, who admitted having committed the murders to satisfy a sexual fetish, was quoted as saying that her ambition was to have killed more people, helpless people, than any other man or woman who ever lived. On June 23, 1902, in the Barnstable County Courthouse, she was found not guilty by reason of insanity and committed for life in the Taunton Insane Hospital. She died there on August 17, 1938, at the age of 84. Born Aileen Carol Pittman on February 29, 1956, in Rochester, Michigan. Her mother, Diane Warnes, born 1939, was 14 years old when she married Aileen's father, 18-year-old Leo Pittman, on June 3, 1954. On March 14, 1955, Diane gave birth to Aileen's older brother, Keith. After less than two years of marriage, and two months before Aileen was born, Diane filed for divorce. She gave birth to Aileen at the age of 16. Aileen never met her father. In 1967, Leo Pittman was sentenced to life imprisonment for kidnapping and assaulting a seven-year-old girl. Pittman was diagnosed with schizophrenia, 
he committed suicide by hanging in prison on January 30, 1969. In January 1960, when Warnos was almost four years old, Diane abandoned her children, leaving them with their maternal grandparents, Lori and Britta Warnos, both alcoholics, who legally adopted Keith and Aileen on March 18, 1960. By the age of 11, Warnos began engaging in sexual activities in school in exchange for cigarettes, drugs, and food. She had also engaged in sexual activities with her brother. Warnos said that her alcoholic grandfather had sexually assaulted and beaten her when she was a child. Before beating her, he would force her to strip out of her clothes. In 1970, at age 14, she became pregnant after being assaulted by a family friend. Warnos gave birth to a boy at a home for unwed mothers on March 23, 1971, and the child was placed for adoption. A few months after her son was born, she dropped out of school at about the same time that her grandmother died of liver failure. When Warnos was 15, her grandfather threw her out of the house, and she began living in the woods near her old home and supported herself through prostitution. On July 17, 1977, her brother Keith died of esophageal cancer and Warnos received $10,000 from his life insurance. She used the money inherited from her brother to buy luxuries, including a car which she wrecked. Warnos and Fell annulled their marriage on July 21st, after only nine weeks. In 1978, at the age of 22, she attempted suicide by shooting herself in the stomach. Between the ages of 14 and 22, she attempted suicide six times. Somehow, she survived them all. On May 20th, 1981, Warnos was arrested in Edgewater, Florida, for the armed robbery of a convenience store, where she stole $35 and two packs of cigarettes. She was sentenced to prison on May 4, 1982, and released on June 30, 1983. On May 1, 1984, Warnos was arrested for attempting to pass forged checks at a bank in Key West. On November 30, 1985, she was named as a suspect in the theft of a revolver and ammunition in Pasco County. Warnos murdered seven men within a period of 12 months. All the men were motorists between the ages of 40 and 65. Richard Charles Mallory, age 51, electronics store owner in Clearwater, date of murder, November 30, 1989. Warnos claimed that Mallory beat, raped, and assaulted her after he drove her to an abandoned area for sexual services. Mallory was Warnos' first victim, and she claimed to have killed him in self-defense. Later, it became known that Mallory had previously been convicted for attempted rape in Maryland. Two days after the murder, a Volusia County deputy sheriff found Mallory's abandoned vehicle. On December 13th, his body was found several miles away in a wooded area. He had been shot several times, and two bullets to the left lung were found to have been the cause of death. David Andrew Spears, age 47, construction worker in Winter Garden was declared missing as of May 19, 1990. On June 1, 1990, his naked body was found along US-19 in Citrus County. He had been shot six times by a 22 caliber pistol. Charles Edmund Carskadden, age 40, part-time rodeo worker, date of murder, May 31, 1990. On June 6, 1990, his body was found in Pasco County. He had been shot nine times with a 22 caliber weapon. The body had been wrapped in an electric blanket and was badly decomposing when found. Witnesses saw Warnos in possession of Karskadden's car, and Warnos had also pawned a gun identified as belonging to Karskadden. Peter Abraham Seams, age 65, retired merchant seaman. In June 1990, Seams left Jupiter, Florida for Arkansas. On July 4, 1990, his car was found in Orange Springs, Florida. Moore and Warnos were seen abandoning the car, and Warnos's palm print was found on the interior door handle. His body was never found. Troy Eugene Barres, age 50, sausage salesman from Ocala, Florida. On July 31, 1990, he was reported missing. On August 4, 1990, his body was found in a wooded area along State Road 19 in Marion County. He had been shot twice. Charles Richard Dick Humphreys, age 56, retired U.S. Air Force Major, former state child abuse investigator, and former chief of police. Date of murder, September 11, 1990. On September 12, 1990, his body was found in Marion County. 
He was fully clothed and had been shot seven times in the head and torso. His car was found in Suwannee County. Walter Gino Antonio, age 62, trucker, security guard, and reserve police officer. On November 19, 1990, Antonio's nearly naked body was found near a remote logging road in Dixie County. He had been shot four times. Five days later, his car was found in Brevard County. Warnos was executed by lethal injection on the morning of October 9, 2002. Her reported last words were, I'd just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus June 6, like the movie, Big Mothership and all, I'll be back. I cannot go in the execution chamber and die in the execution chamber as a liar. And I cannot go in the execution chamber and be executed under the devil. I have to come clean and clean, cleanse my spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, so I have to come clean and tell the world the lies that went on through my mouth. I mean, the, now prosecutors and well, cops. And that, you, and that you killed the seven men. Huh? That you killed those men in cold blood. Yeah, and i got to come clean that I killed those seven men in first-degree murder and robbery. As they said, they had it right. A serial killer. Not so much like thrill kill. I was into the Robin biz. I mean, you know, serial killers are in this thrill killing jazz. I was into the robbing, just and eliminate a witness. But still, then again, I got a number, so it's serial killer. But I'm coming clean before I go in that execution chamber and be executed. That uh, I killed him. And like so, this. when you met them from the beginning, did you know that you were going to kill them when they picked you up in that cars? I. Pretty much, <clears throat> I had pretty much had them so, uh, selected that they were going to die. No self-defense. No, there was no self-defense. Uh, I'm being really straight up about mm -hmm. everything. There's no self-defense. I'm really sorry what happened about everything. I, I was in, in this, this, to me, this world is nothing but evil, and all of us are full of evil one way or another. Evil in us, all of us do, mm -hmm. and my evil we just happened to come out because of the circumstances of what I was doing. Hitchhiking, hooking, mm -hmm. on the road. I was a homeless person all my life. Mm -hmm. And then the hitchhiking, hooking, I learned off the homelessness and, and cruising all over the United States of America and stuff.